Right, thank you very much and uh, a, a very warm good evening from Australia, or good night in fact from Australia to you all. Um, we are talking about uh, nefarious behaviour online and so I think they've given us the graveyard shift. It's 11pm uh, uh, here, in, here in Brisbane and uh, not much earlier for a number of us elsewhere. Um, uh, I'm really happy to present this uh, panel with uh, colleagues from around the world, quite literally, um, on uh, coordinated inauthentic behaviour. And um, I'd like to start actually to begin with by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands upon which I and my colleague Dan Angus are working as well, with the Turbul and Yagara people, uh, to uh, acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging, and recognise that the lands upon which we work are unceded and have always been places of teaching and learning. Um, now, this panel has, a, uh, has four uh, speakers, four papers, and uh, we'll run through them in the, uh, the order that you see in your program. Everyone's got about 15 minutes to present, and um, we'll keep the Q&A for after the four presentations. Um, so I'd like to invite uh, Marianne Andre Rizoyu um, to present the first paper, Discovering the Strategies of Coordinated Disinformation via Hawks Intensity Pro Processes. Thanks, Maria. Thank you very much, uh, Axel, for the introduction. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and present our work. I will now uh, try to share my desktop and put it in full screen mode. Can, can you please show me a thumbs up if... Okay, great. Cool. So, hi, everyone. Thanks for, um, thanks for being here. Um, so my name is Marian Andrew Rizoyu. I lead the behavioral data science at uh, the University of Technology in Sydney. Today I'm going to be discovering a, I'm going to be discussing about discovering coordinated disinformation uh, via hoax processes. And this presentation is joint work with Timothy Graham uh, and then Professors Axel Bruns and Dan Angus here in the um, here in the uh, in the audience. Now I'm going to preface this presentation by uh, saying that I'm a computer scientist. Scientist. So what you're going to see here is going to be a lens uh, from a computer scientist. So if some things don't look quite or quite right, we can blame it on that. So um, when it comes to computer science and and this information, um, most works out there take a content. Uh, driven approach, which means that we deploy deep neural networks to learn from the past and try to predict the future. However, this suffers from what we call a Red Queen effect. You may remember in Alice in Wonderland when the Red Queen looks at Alice, which, who started running, and tells her, now all you need to do is run as fast as you can just to stay in the same place. We use the Red Queen effect to actually denote the fact that there is an arms race between us who deploy natural language processing approaches and, well, the adversaries who all they need to do is change their approaches, tweak their language, do slight changes in order to uh, evade detection. What is our hypothesis and our solution? Our hypothesis is that we can actually dis distinguish these individuals. We can detect them, not based on the content that they emit, but rather based on the uh, reaction of the online social system around them. So the logic is here that while the, the, the um, actors like the social bots or the trolls may be able to conceal their actions, they cannot conceal the reaction of the social system around them to their actions because that's what they are trying to achieve. So in the rest of this presentation, first I'm gonna be briefly introducing the tool, the Hox processes, and then I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, case studies in which we apply them. First of all, Richard Cascades. Um, this is probably uh, knowledge for everyone, but just in case we denote the Richard Cascade as a collection of timestamp Richard events. Um, in case of Twitter, this can be retweets of an initial online post. So the idea is the act of resharing, of reposting, uh, with uh, and and pushing it through the social system, through our uh, immediate neighborhood. Now, with this in mind, the next slide is going to be slightly technical, but there it is, the only technical slide there. So the tool we're using is the Hox processes. The Hox processes are a flavor of Poisson processes, which are point processes. Um, in simply put, these are mathematical models which account for what we call the self-excitation property. So. The occurrence of an event 
is likely to increase the, the emergence of future events. I'm going to give you an example. Here, let's assume that we have the blue event, which will generate new events with this uh, time decaying uh, function, which is shown here in blue. The, the blue event generates two, ch two children event, the red event and the green event, who in turn will generate their own events. So you can already start seeing that this mathematical model, what it does, it, uh, uh, it accounts for um, phenomena like word of mouth, where the, where the information spreads from individual to individual. Now, the, the mathematical formulation is shown here. This is called the event intensity, and, you, and we, we, uh, we obtain this, this self-excitation through the summation term. But what is really important is that in this uh, decaying part of the influence, we are modeling three components, which we found that are very, uh, which are important. One is what we call the content virality, how, light, how much the content is catching up. The second is user influence, the size of their followership. And finally, we have the memory decay. This can be uh, roughly understood as the amount of time that a particular content stays in the, in the collective memory. Now, this works for one piece of uh, one reshare cascade. However, when we talk about a user, when we talk about uh, a piece of content such as YouTube videos, or when we talk about entire publishers, they will not generate one reshare cascade. They will generate multiple reshare cascades associated with the same content. So what we did, we, uh, we proposed recently an, uh, an approach, which is called a mixture model-based approach, where we fit all the all the cascades we jointly fit all the cascades relating to one of these entities together so now what we obtain we obtain a set of parameters of the model which describe not one research cascade but they they describe the the reaction of the social system to that particular entity so so in other words it describes how the social system reacts to say a tweet by our user or uh, about the content or our publisher Okay, now that I've showed you uh, the mathematical tool, let me show you a bit of the results that we have obtained and uh, some of the case studies. I'm going to be showing you three case studies. The first case study uh, is separating controversial from reputable uh, news sources. This is based on two retweet uh, cascades, which were uh, provided uh, by, um, by uh, the, our colleagues in uh, and QT. And in here, we have the Australian Twitter News Index, which follows um, um, high quality Twitter news, uh, news producers. Things, um, this might not be very well known for our colleagues in Europe, but the Sydney Morning Herald, ABC, and CNN is well known, but uh, ABC, these are uh, well known traditional uh, news producers. The Cynics, the controversial news index, is uh, following news producers such as Breitbart, Russia Today, and, and Red State, which could be by some standards considered controversial news sources. So what we do here, we take all the, all the cascades which are relating to the content produced by these producers, we put them through our models, and then we plug it through a dimensionality reduction technique, which allows them to, pro to project them in, the two in a two-dimensional space. So what you see in here, in red, you have the reputable news sources, and in black, you have the controversial news sources. For a couple of conclusions, you can already see that the two types of news sources are separable in this space that we have created based solely on how their information spreads. We have not done any content analysis here. We did not read the, the sources. We simply looked at how the social system reacts to content emitted by these sources, and we find that they are separable. And in, in, in machine learning, separable means we can build classifiers. We can build automatic machine learning tools to, to classify content into these two categories based solely on how the social system reacts to them. The second case study is about uh, looking at social bots and online influence in, uh, in, in these cases in COVID discussions. Here I'm introducing a, a tool that we have developed. It's called Burst Potter. It is a software package designed at detecting online social bots and estimating online influence based on retweet cascades. It is aimed at non-computer science specialist is designed to be to have either a graphical interface like the one that I'm showing you here or uh, can be used really easily in a couple of lines of code in Python or R depending on um, depending on the preference. Now in here what we did we took um, a set of, of discussions around COVID-19 from January uh, last year uh, January this year and 
we did exactly the same thing. We project them in this space. So now each dot is a user. So we're taking all the caskets of users. But in addition to what I showed you earlier, we are also estimating their online influence. And we are trying and we're detecting if they're social, if they're bots or not. What do we see here? There's a couple of cool findings. One, you see that there is a, a clear separability between a, a group of users where uh, most, most bots reside and uh, the other side. We see also that influence decays as we move to from the bottom left to the top right. And there's the, the, the conclusion we got here is that while most there are most bots actually don't have any don't have much influence and we know that we know that uh, most bots actually don't get much however there are some who wield quite considerable influence such an approach could be leveraged to detect which bots we should uh, address or follow or at least keep an eye on um, finally the last case study i want to show you is about coordinating these information campaigns during the australian elections so this data set was collected in the 2019 Australian election period. Um, we have about 70 million tweets um, and they were crawled using the hashtag OSPO, which is for Australian politics. Now, um, in, during those elections, our European colleagues again might not know, but um, there, was, um, there was a rumor that the left-leaning party wants to introduce an inheritance tax and including the, the treasurer, Australian treasurer in, uh, weighed in and uh, sort of reinforced this uh, fake information. Now, what is interesting when you when we plot the, the discussion network of this, of this we, obtain, we see that there's two clear structures, two clear communities with the right class. So in here, every node is a, is a user and then connections are retweeted. This is very typical social network analysis. And what we see in here, there's two, two clear clusters. And when we looked into the text that they emitted, we, ob we observed that the right cluster seemed to be pushing more of what we call the disinformation and the left cluster was a debunking. But a couple of really interesting observations were also that the, the two do not look the same and they don't feel the same. The disinformation cluster is tightly connected all of the users tend to, the central users tend to retweet each other. They tweet about the, the same times and even the timing of the, of the tweets is a, bit, is a bit peculiar. Whereas the right-hand side cluster seems more like an organic, loosely connected uh, connection of users where you have central users tweeting and then a, a number of these uh, retweeters as you see these little clouds here in, in the different areas. There's very few connections between the two clusters. However, we can see a bit more when we start looking into the content of the clusters. So in the disinformation cluster, I'm showing you here, um, I'm showing you here um, a word cloud of the use of what is being talked about. And uh, we see a couple of interesting uh, bits. We see some Nazi style references, things like sentimental jewelry, gold teeth, uh, spiteful uh, phrases, we see loose parents, uh, we see worth dead and truly screwed. And uh, moreover, we see confirmative language, things like experts confirmed, we, uh, we have now proof of. Also not shown here, um, the, the sentiment analysis of these of the text emitted here is quite interesting because it's both, bo it's both more negative and more positive uh, than we would see in the debunking cluster, which tends to be more objective. Now that we're talking about the debunking cluster, it is the messaging here is mainly oriented around uh, calling out the disinformation. So we see fabricated, completely false scare campaign. And just to, to show you why we believe this is, uh, this is uh, coordinated, I'm going to show you the exposure graphic. This exposure graphic tells you an upper bound on the number of people that have seen the messages in the two clusters. So. In Twitter, you, you don't know how many people saw a message, but you can estimate the upper bound by summing up the number of followers of the users that emit a tweet. In blue, we have the misinformation, the uh, upper bound for the misinformation cluster. In red, you have the debunking cluster. Interestingly enough, the vertical line shows the date of the elections. As you can see, the, the misinformation activity ends on the day of the election and every, virtually everything happens before the elections whereas most of the debunking actually happens after the elections, um, which makes us uh, um, think a bit about the, the motives behind it. So in conclusion, I have showed you here, I have shown in this uh, presentation 
two parts. First, I showed you a mathematical tool, a Hox point process, which can be deployed to model and describe information spread, but also to characterize a number of online items and users and content. Finally, I've showed you three case studies in where we applied these approaches together with other quantitative uh, analysis, such as social network analysis, in order to, um, to, uh, quanti to characterize controversial news sources in authentic users and coordinated campaigns. And with this, I thank you very much. And before uh, ending, I'm just going to tell you that the code and data for most of the work that I presented here is available online via GitHub. Particularly, the particularly our user uh, social bus detection system, which can, which also has quite a number of tutorials and um, and uh, resources. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Marian, Andre, and um, thank you for keeping very well to time as well. Um, uh, that was a really interesting presentation. Um, Again, I'd, I'd ask you uh, all to uh, please add your questions to our Q&A &A function so we can get back to them at the end of the four presentations. Um, but for the moment, we'll move on immediately to Fabio Giulietto from the University of Urbino, um, uh, who with his team there has been, done, has been doing fantastic work on Italian elections uh, for some time. And this particular um, paper uh, presents research on the coordinated link sharing behavior during the 2018 and 2019 Italian elections. So uh, over to you, Fabio. Thank you, Axel. Uh, I hope everyone can see the slides. Uh, uh, can you see it? Still starting to share for me, still Fabio. Okay. Should I go on? Just give it another go, perhaps. Okay, let me try again. I don't know if it's just me or if, if others have that problem as well. I think we can't, yeah, we can't see yeah. them yet, Fabio. I don't see it either. Okay, let's uh, let's do this. Um, if we can go on to the next presenter, I will try to understand what's going on, uh, and uh, I will be the uh, next or the last okay. presenter. No, no. Ah, oh, no. Here we go. Hang on. You're there. Go for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it took it took a while. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Axel. Uh, this, uh, uh, I will try to present uh, the, mainly the method we, um, uh, we developed uh, during the 2018 and 2019 election, but the, the, um, the real title uh, of the presentation I, is uh, more around um, uh, COVID-19 information. Uh, so the case study will be, uh, the, the method will, will be applied uh, specifically to COVID-19 info uh, in Italy. So uh, I will try to uh, give um, a brief definitions of what we mean by coordinated link sharing behavior and uh, what we mean by um, uh, how we use the ABC framework. And uh, then we, uh, we will show how uh, the ABC framework uh, was applied in Cornet. Uh, and finally, uh, I will explain our case study. Uh, first of all, uh, coordinated uh, inauthentic behavior uh, uh, and coordinated link sharing behavior, of course, are two related concepts, uh, but uh, coordinated link sharing, link sharing behavior is uh, somehow a subset of the uh, coordinated inauthentic behavior, which looks specifically uh, to one uh, very uh, limited uh, behavior, which is link sharing. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is that uh, we look into um, uh, two uh, different uh, uh, 
things. Uh, the first is the amount of time um, uh, used by uh, different accounts on social media to share uh, the same uh, URL, the same link. Uh, and then uh, we uh, look at the amount of repetition of this kind of coordinated uh, behavior in sharing links. So the rationale is that while it may be common that uh, two different accounts on social media share the same or maybe in a very short period of time, it is very unlikely that this happens uh, continuously or, or uh, at least very often. Um, so the idea is that on the one hand, we estimate uh, a time interval, uh, which uh, identified uh, our uh, shares uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, potentially coordinated shares because they are shared in a very short period of time. And then we group entities depending on uh, how much they repeated this coordinated behavior. And the, and the tool is based on um, uh, crowd tangle link API endpoint. So we developed this R package, which is called Cornet, um, and it is available uh, on uh, GitHub, uh, which exposes several functions, but the main two uh, are get uh, city share, which uh, basically query the uh, crowd tangle endpoint to get the shares for all the URLs you are interested into. And then the, the get called share, which actually uh, detects the coordinated network. Um, uh, Marianne already introduced the idea, the difference between uh, approaching this information by looking at the content uh, only uh, or by looking at different uh, kind of vectors. Uh, and uh, this, is, this was uh, very well summarized by uh, Camille Francois when she introduced the idea of the ABC framework, uh, where uh, you have uh, um, uh, actors, behavior, and content. Uh, and uh, the idea is uh, that if you uh, focus only on content, uh, you uh, risk to um, uh, look at only at a certain part of the phenomenon. And plus, it will be easy for uh, uh, those uh, trying to deceive to change their, uh, their behavior, their, uh, their, their type of content a little bit to uh, mislead uh, those who are in charge of uh, uh, detecting this kind of operations. So uh, uh, Cornet basically uh, uses this uh, approach uh, and the uh, process with Cornet starts from a list of uh, links, a list of URLs, uh, and the system itself detects uh, the coordinated link sharing behavior um, and outputs a list of actors who uh, have been involved in this kind of behavior, uh, distinguished in different networks. Uh, then if you uh, uh, look into the content uh, uh, produced and shared by this set of entities, uh, uh, you end up with another list of URLs that you can feed back in Cornet to uh, have multiple iteration of this process in order to uh, keep the list of uh, uh, problematic entities updated in time. Um, this is uh, an example of, uh, of our case study. Uh, we started in this case from uh, a, a data sets of uh, uh, problematic URLs um, identified by uh, the IFCN, uh, which is the International Association of Fact Checkers. Uh, they provided us with this database of uh, uh, false claims related to uh, COVID-19, and we uh, used uh, uh, around 200 uh, claims uh, uh, specifically concerning Italy. From this claim, we used CrowdTangle to identify instances of this claim because the same claim, of course, can be um, uh, used in different URLs. So we used CrowdTangle to identify the around 1,000 URLs related to the claims we started from. And then we used Cornet, which uh, identified around um, um, 13,000 shares on Facebook of these uh, URLs. And then we identified a list of 152 um, 
manipulative actors or coordinated networks, as, you, as we used to call it. Uh, then we um, uh, uh, extract from uh, these networks uh, a list of URLs shared by this, uh, the entities belonging to this network. And so we started the second iteration. And the second iteration uh, um, end up by uh, identifying uh, 344 accounts uh, divided in 33 uh, components. So once you um, uh, have your final uh, data set uh, uh, and you decided that uh, uh, the iteration you have been through uh, are um, uh, enough or uh, you are already uh, uh, using the most up-to-date uh, data, uh, then you can analyze the content. We use we used to do it uh, at three different levels. What we call the macro level, which uh, allows us to depict uh, a sort of uh, map of the uh, networks we are um, observing. And in this case, uh, you, you can clearly see that we, identif we identified several. Um, uh, coordinated networks strictly re related with uh, um, uh, conspiracy theory and uh, um, uh, COVID skepti skepticism at, at the different level, including an anti-5G uh, cluster. Uh, but the most in interesting part was the red cluster uh, you can see belongs to the main uh, giant component uh, because it was um, part of the political content and uh, specifically um, uh, closely related to the right wing area. Uh, of the Italian politics. And when we zoom in on this cluster, you can see that um, uh, you, you find um, political uh, entities, uh, uh, for example, things like Basta Euro, uh, Stop Euro, uh, so uh, against the, the European Union and the, Euro, and the Euro itself, uh, um, anti 5G, New World Order, uh, uh, as well as uh, um, uh, pages and groups against vaccination. When we look at that, the uh, amount of interaction uh, uh, generated by this group of conspiracy uh, related um, uh, groups and pages, and uh, we compared it to uh, groups and pages uh, non conspiracy related, uh, we observed that um, while both groups uh, during the lockdown the Italian national lockdown uh, during 2020, they increased the number of interaction. You can clearly see that the amount of increase for the uh, conspiracy related groups uh, is uh, at least two or three times more than the, the amount, the, the increase uh, observed for uh, non-conspiracy related uh, uh, groups. And then at the meso level, uh, you can um, uh, deep, uh, uh, dive into one uh, specific network. Uh, for example, in this case, in these cases, we are observing a network, uh, act, a coordinated network act, active in Italy uh, since 2017. Um, but what it is interesting here is that um, the um, amount of coordinated activity uh, increased uh, in, uh, in, uh, during the month of the, of the lockdown and uh, they are still uh, using all the pages in their network to coordinate their activity, sharing the same uh, links from the same domains in order to um, uh, to share their content more broadly. Um, and you can also, uh, uh, when, when you uh, look into these uh, groups specifically, in these uh, networks specifically, uh, you can clearly see uh, how they change the, their behavior over time to avoid the, uh, detection and, and uh, uh, avoid being banned by um, or, or penalized by social uh, that by, by platforms. So, for example, in this case, uh, you can see that the same network uh, shared in a coordinated way multiple different uh, domains over time. So they uh, keep changing the domain they are uh, using. Um, and once uh, one domain becomes too um, uh, low quality, uh, 
to and, and analyzed by uh, social media platform, they simply change the domain. So it's it's very important that when you design a study uh, which is used uh, which is based on a list of pro well known problematic problematic domain, you have to keep in mind that uh, these things tend to change over time very quickly. Uh, and the strategy itself of posting links change. As you can see, uh, what they are doing now is uh, to post uh, the link uh, in the first uh, comment of the post. So the link is not part of the post anymore, and it is very difficult to detect as a link post, uh, both for, for, for platform and for uh, uh, us. And finally, at the micro level, you can look at single uh, news stories. Um, uh, and this is uh, a few examples of uh, um, uh, stories uh, surfaced by this method. Uh, again, we are not looking at the content, uh, we are looking only at the behavior. But once, once you look at the content, then you realize that uh, the content is problematic as well. And Cornet also allows you to uh, draw this uh, kind of charts uh, where you can see uh, the uh, total number of shares over time uh, and uh, who, uh, which actor uh, on uh, social media contributed uh, with their share to increasing this amount of uh, uh, shares. And I will uh, stop here. I, I hope that uh, um, it was possible to see me because uh, and to hear me because uh, um, I'm uh, my my screen is all uh, frozen. So uh, I will just stop here and we'll see what happens. Thank you, Fabio. We could we could see your presentation well. I don't think we can see you at the moment, but we certainly could see your presentation. So. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, the more I, I see these presentations, I want to just steal everyone's methods and, and do more work. It's just fascinating to see this all. Um, so uh, thank you very much for that. And again, for keeping to time as well. Um, we'll move on uh, immediately to my colleague, Dan Angus, presenting work on uh, recurrence plotting for detecting duplicate online posting activities. Uh, over to you, Dan. And I think Fabio, you might have to stop sharing your screen. If Fabio can. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Fabio. Yep. Perfect. Um, my internet has been a little bit dicey, so hopefully everything works okay and we don't get any outages. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, Axel, and um, to the other presenters. Um, I'm presenting this paper on behalf of a small group of us here. It's uh, QT uh, DMRC, um, two of which are actually um, since the initial kind of rescheduling of this have since departed us. So Tobias Keller, he's now back in Switzerland in private industry and um, and Dr. Brenna Moon, who's um, moved on into other adventures, but, um, but certainly still with us is um, Timothy and um, Axel as well. So yeah, this is a small study of um, the use of a technique that um, I'm kind of fond of, I guess, I've, I've used for some time called recurrence plotting. And um, the thought of how we could use this, this particular mathematical technique to aid in detecting duplicate online posting activities um, online. So this is a, a case study that came to us, um, or I should say, sorry, first, the focus really here is um, uh, similar to Fabio's work, um, the orchestration of uh, multiple accounts that are the posting coordinated um, duplicate posting behaviors. So really about this idea of boosting visibility of particular content um, through coordinated activities, but really about um, duplication of those activities and actions across multiple accounts. So in this case, we're looking at Facebook and how Facebook um, pages are being set up in different jurisdictions perhaps, but posting similar content to reach slightly different audiences. Um, as we get into the case, you'll see it's kind of active in, in different um, jurisdictions such as Australia, Canada, um, America and, and others. So the case study came to us through some um, connections we have with The Guardian um, here in Australia, who kind of like to come to us for advice around um, particular online mis and disinformation activities, in this case, um, some far right activity that they had been clued into. Um, and it resulted in this, this article, which is a, it's a fascinating insight into the kind of behind the scenes of some of these, um, these operations. 
And um, and so I, I highly recommend you you read this article um, if you haven't already, because it does go into some detail and they did do a, an amazing amount of journalistic work to kind of discover the, the motivations and, and some of the activities of the administrators um, in, at the center of all of this. Um, and, and this is part of a, a larger project of theirs um, called the Transparency Project. So a big shout out to the, the journalists involved in this work, uh, particularly Christopher Nelson and, and Michael McGowan and, and Nick Evershed, who's a data journalist here. Um, and of course, their correspondent Oliver Holmes in Jerusalem, who actually tracked down the, one of the main admins of these, these pages. Um, so essentially what they uncovered here was a covert plot to uh, take over essentially a lot of these far-right pages. So these far-right pages had existed on Facebook for some time um, and they revealed that there was a particular agent or actor who managed to find their way into an administrative role inside these Facebook pages and then essentially start to convert or, or, or take ownership of the kinds of content that was being posted on those Facebook pages. And really the motivation here was commercial. Um, what The Guardian um, supposed and, and, and kind of dug around and found out was that um, largely this, this one actor was setting up a bunch of websites that were being loaded with click, you know, Google ad based revenue generation um, services. So there were 21 Facebook pages that they discovered within this coordination network, um, you know, more than a thousand coordinated faked um, news posts per week were being posted to these pages and linked back to a small number of these, these kinds of fake um, news sites. Now news, the word fake news, it's, I know it's a very problematic concept. Axel and I are working very hard to kind of move beyond this, but to describe these, these are, these are pages set up that are posting, you know, nonsense content um, that is dressed up as news content, but purely for this um, commercial, uh, commercially driven means. Um, the reach of these um, is, is greater than a million followers. So we're talking about a significant operation with significant reach here. Um, and as I said, funneled these audiences to a cluster of these 10 or so ad heavy websites. Um, now, some initial analysis of the data that the Guardian shared with us showed that, yes, there's something very dodgy going on here. So the first thing we did was look at, for example, the, the timing of posts made to pages um, for particular periods. So this is from the 1st of February 2018 to the 1st of November 2019. And what we've done here is just in Tableau done a simple aggregation across a number of these pages to look at the time that posts are being made. And what you can see here is that posts are being made pretty much on the top of the hour. So very much at the zeroth minute um, with some you know other posts being dotted around in other times. So immediately for everybody in the room, you smell a rat here that you know, something is, is definitely up with this. Um, but digging a bit further, what really struck me was um, not just the timing, but the actual, the, the ordering of the posts. Um, but the subtext that I should kind of explore here as well and, and, and give you a bit of an insight into is the kind of gradual nature in which this admin, this, this key admin at the center of the story had taken over these pages. So this graphic that the, the Guardian um, provided in the story gives you an idea of this, that these pages um, had perhaps existed and, and were posting organic far-right content, uh, you know, ahead of this, this kind of January 2018 takeover, where at which point you start to see a switch into this more kind of duplicated posting activity. So this, this graph um, is, is really just showing of this network of these, these pages, um, the, the proportion of unique posts versus duplicated posts. So a transition out of like, I guess, organic posting activity, still problematic, but organic in that sense to this kind of high duplication. So what does this look like? So if we colorize um, you know, an individual link to an individual one of these, um, these problematic news stories um, and look at this in, in this kind of a view here where every line represents um, an individual post made to one of these pages. As we can see, the page names already give away their problematic nature. But as you, you go along, what you notice is an alignment between 
the, the same posts being made across a number of these pages um, by looking vertically across those. There is some variation on some of these pages. So for example, this Christian stand with Trump um, CSWT varies um, a little bit from some of the others, which appear to be more in lockstep with each other. So for example, the, the no shari in my country, love it or leave this fourth one down and the fifth one down, the no sharia law, never ever give up Australia, seem to be posting pretty much you know, identical content, but with some minor variations there. And it's at that point that I started thinking, well, could a technique like recurrence plotting help us make sense of uh, and give us a numerical way to assess the degree of this, this repetition of content? So within this as well, um, with some of these, I was wondering, is it that they are all posting necessarily the same information on the same time or is there time shifts going on? Is this operator perhaps waiting um, and, and shifting things out by, by some time period? And recurrence plotting is um, a good technique to get at this because it doesn't necessarily rely on the exact timing information um, to indicate a match. And I'll explain that in a little bit. So with recurrence plots, these are an old technique they were developed um, from the, the late 80s. Um, and um, here is an example of them in use in, in other kinds of studies. So um, this is with a weather system, the Southern Oscillation Index. Um, and within that, you see how within that SOI, um, as this index varies, you get these recurrence lines. So this, this um, kind of uh, diagonal line that's running up um, the side, if you, you can isolate any of these off the, the kind of midpoint of this graph, if I annotate this, it might make it a bit easier, sorry. So what we're looking for are, are these, these kinds of diagonals that indicate that this system that we're studying is repeating itself, but it's repeating itself offset in time. So in this way, you can pick up if a system is repeating itself, but it's doing so at some say, you know, days, hours, weeks, months apart. So how much is this system actually going through the same trajectory through some kind of uh, a phase space? If we look at these human ECG recordings, you see a much tighter kind of periodicity and you see this, you know, lots of these diagonal lines running through. So then applying this to, um, to our study of this problematic news content and this URL sharing, um, we're gonna look at one of these, and sorry, I'll just get rid of this annotation um, from the screen. Um, now I realize this is quite faint um, and, and possibly quite faint on your screen. So I'll, I'll try and um, annotate it as we go through. But what we do is we take a sequence of posts made to these pages and we give each a unique ID. So a unique URL gets a unique ID. And then we take two different pages and we use what's called a cross-recurrence plot. And within that cross-recurrence plot, we line up the posts in the order that they were posted to the page. So it doesn't matter if there are days or hours apart, it's just the strict ordering of the posts. We line them up across those two axes. And then what we look for are any points at which there are intersection similarities between those. Now, Proper recurrence plotting can do other things. It can embed um, do things like time shifting and time embedding. Um, but in this, we keep it quite simple, very much to um, an embedding of one. Um, and so you really are just getting strict matches. And what we see here is in the first um, period of time of these two pages, this what I call phase one, we don't see any recurrence points. So that suggests that for that early part of time, these pages are posting different content. There's no you know, similar content being shared. As we move into the next period here, there is a little bit of sharing. So we see repeated posting activities early in this phase. Um, and then we start to see the emergence of, of this faint diagonal line. But then it's in this third phase that we see this, this very straight and, and very continuous diagonal line uh, appearing, which suggests that these two pages are posting the same links in the same order within uh, on those two pages. Um, and that's what we're really interested in is trying to locate those diagonal lines that suggest that the same um, information is being posted in the same order. 
So going one step further, there's a series of tools called RQA, Recurrence Quantification Analysis, that we can use to not necessarily just visualize this, but um, numerically quantify this kind of um, activity, this kind of coordination. And there's three measures that I think are of interest here um, to measure the dynamics of recurrence between these two time series. The first is determinism, which is really what it means is the percentage of recurrence between these series arranged purely on those diagonal lines. And so if you've got two systems that are, um, in this case, two Facebook pages, which are posting the same content in the same order um, from start to kind of finish of your time period, you would get a determinism of one. Anything less, if you've got completely different content, you would get a determinism of zero. So it's somewhere between that. Longest diagonal line length is interesting because it gives you an idea of for, you know, the longest kind of unbroken sequence of these posts um, you know, in, in both pages. And the average obviously then takes all the averages of all those diagonal line lengths to give you a, an expression of that, um, which is also interesting. So within this, looking at the pages and a subset of pages that were um, kind of provided um, intel around from the Guardian colleagues, um, you see that these scores for determinism are incredibly high. So they're all very much up in that kind of that 90% that or higher range, which would absolutely suggest that they are posting you know, long, very long sequences um, of the same kinds of activities. So there is no doubt in our minds that these are, there is some form of coordination occurring here. Um, if we look at the average diagonals, that's absolutely the case. So we're seeing sequences, uh, you know, in the kind of you know, average of seven or, or so, um, you know, sequenced. Um, and then there might be say one organic post that is made to those pages that is different. Now that is interesting because aside from, okay, they're coordinated, so what? This gives us an understanding of the kind of average sequence length before they might interject with some other kind of content, maybe to throw people off the scent or to kind of, you know, given the personalization of these pages. Um, so that, that kind of more that degree of takeover perhaps by that particular administrator. And then the longest diagonals is, is interesting as well. In one case um, of two pages here, the assimilate or migrate, and Australia says no more refugees, um, we see this whopping huge um, diagonal. So this suggests there was a one kind of unbroken string of posts that were similar between both of the 521 links without a single post that broke that, that sequence out. So absolutely no question um, that those two were under full control of this administrator in posting that content. Right, so just to wrap up. So, I mean, this is a very cursory analysis using this, uh, what is a very highly powered technique in many ways of recurrence plotting, uh, but to show how this could provide additional quantitative evidence of specific phases of coordination. So that, that plot I showed that showed that kind of gradual takeover of this page, um, all these pages by this particular agent, you, you can kind of see that um, and, and provide that additional quantitative evidence to say, you know, what happened through those phases. The RQA measure is useful as quantifying that degree of coordination as well, particularly things like average diagonal line length, good to kind of be able to express the degree to which these, these pages um, are posting similar content. Um, future work I really want to use to examine applicability and potential extension of measures where less strict coordination is occurring. And I said this is a very biased sample we're dealing with in the first instance. We knew that there was a lot of coordination um, happening here already. Um, and that's what, you know, kind of triggered the Guardian to explore these. And so really our analysis was more confirmatory than anything, but to kind of, you know, bridge out to other examples to look at what other kinds of coordination is, is happening here. Um, recurrence plotting doesn't just necessarily need to operate over, you know, strict kind of this link to this link. You could break down even to um, the actual domain or subdomain level and look for, you know, similarity between those and, and try and find other patterns of, of recurrence that way. Um, and lastly, I'll just acknowledge that um, a lot of this analysis was made possible through this um, fabulous um, Pi RQA package by, um, by colleagues um, over in uh, Berlin. And, um, and the link is there if you want to try it out in your own work. I will leave it there. Fantastic. Thank you, Dan. And uh, now on to our last speaker in Hong Kong, um, uh, Francisca Keller. Uh, speaking uh, about astroturfing in Hong Kong and elsewhere, patterns of coordination in hidden Twitter campaigns. Over to you, Francis.
and you're muted. Uh, Francisca, sorry, you're you're muted. Okay, there we go. Sorry. Okay, um, so sorry, bear with me, but the title is a bit different. Be, um, we, we're still going to talk about Chinese astroturfing campaigns in Hong Kong, but that's just going to be a small part of, of, of it. Um, so this is sort of more interdisciplinary research, and we're trying to put it a bit more in a sort of social science context. So it's not going to be quite as technical as the other um, presentations. Um, and it's um, co-authored with um, David, who's a um, computer scientist, Sebastian, um, political um, scientist as I, and John Juan, who is um, political communications. Um, can we get this thing to yeah, begin? Okay, um, so we are concerned about political astroturfing. Um, and you probably are sort of familiar with the term. You probably also know that it's sort of based on this rather bad pun regarding um, artificial grass and artificial grassroots that these campaigns are supposed to um, imitate. And so hence this carpet astroturf that imitates grass because it's supposed to imitate fake grassroots. Um, in the social science literature, um, Edward Walker has sort of um, uh, talked a lot about that also in offline context. This idea that you can centrally coordinate campaigns that are supposed to be that are supposed to look like they are sort of decentralized, genuine grassroots sentiments that just sort of bubbles up and and it appears to be the sort of the genuine expression of the people's will. Um, this sort of general disinformation um, has happened all across the world in diff and, and, and now we're talking sort of specifically on, on online. So I think we don't need to sweat to do well on that, right? Um, I'm just sort of trying to put this more into sort of general theoretical context. Um, and so what we are sort of struggling with is the fact that I think a lot of the literature focuses um, or you, I used to focus a lot on social bots which we just see as one particular tool of that can be used in an astroturfing campaign. You can either pay people or you can program an account to behave like a paid um, person. Um, and so we're just, we're, 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 we don't want to criticize this sort of bot detection literature too, mu too much, but we think it sort of tends to focus too much on the um, um, automated nature of the account as opposed to what we're usually really interested in, which is sort of a campaign that tries to influence public opinion. Um, it also doesn't necessarily need to contain fake news. So astroturfing can be completely composed of just spreading factually correct information, but we would still call it a form of disinformation because there is a sort of deception involved on part of who the accounts um, claim to be. Um, and so in that sense, and, and they do that with the intention of um, deceiving people, not as a sort of mistake, right? So, so hence we, saying, we think it is uh, correct to classify this as disinformation. And so what we see as our contribution here is sort of a relatively simple platform and language independent detection method that is um, that seems to work surprisingly even on very recent campaigns. Um, and we try to sort of link it a bit to social the uh, science theory as a, um, um, and, and, and argue why it might be that these um, patterns persist and we can still use it even in most in the most recent campaigns. As I mentioned, the current literature is all had, has a heavy focus on social bots. We think this is partly because it's relatively hard to find ground truth in this information, um, right? So if you're, if there's always going to be a big debate about whether a specific account is part of a campaign and whether uh, or, or whether they are genuine, genuine people who genuinely believe what they're saying. Um, and so one reason why I think the literature has focused on social bots is because most people think they can spot an automated account. I'm not entirely sure that is correct, but, you know, um, and so it's relatively easy to program an algorithm, develop uh, and, and, and say like, okay, these accounts must be bots. And then maybe have a graduate student look at these and go like, yeah, these look, really look like bots. Um, and so our research really started out almost, I think, five years ago by with a case that had a ground truth data that was independent from the online activity because we looked at um, a campaign by the South Korean um, Secret Service um, to interfere in the election in 2012. They were discovered and their laptops were confiscated. And so we had a, on, these, on these laptops and then in, in published in the court documents, a list of Twitter accounts that we couldn't, that we knew were associated with this particular campaign. 
And so we detected some interesting patterns that made sense from a social science perspective. And so then in this paper, we were sort of trying to go like, okay, is this a pattern that still exists even in, in, in campaigns that have been waged since um, in the last 10 years? Um, and remarkably, it's, it still seems to work, right? You could still detect campaigns like that um, in the most recent um, campaigns published by Twitter. Um, and so sort of our, our argument is basically AstroTown campaigns are centrally coordinated and they're implemented by extrinsically motivated agents. Um, while decentralized campaigns, and this is more of a spectrum than an actual sort of binary, right? Um, they tend to be um, organized uh, in more in a decentralized fashion, um, grassroots campaigns, and they're implemented by people who are genuinely motivated to, to engage in this sort of, um, in, in this work. And so that causes principal agent problems for the astroturfing campaigns. And these then lead to certain patterns of over-coordinated messages, and over coordinated both in the sense of the timing and the content. Okay, and so principal agent theory is sort of a relatively well, um, well established um, framework, I guess. So where we have a principal, sort of the boss, the manager, the state, the party, um, and they want to have a successful and convincing astroturfing campaign. Um, on the other hand, they have these people that they hire or otherwise incentivize um, that basically work for the campaign and usually control multiple accounts, but are not particularly motivated in itself um, to do a good job in that. Um, and so because of that, because of this mismatch between the incentives of the, the, uh, the goals of the principal and be it, then the goals of the agents who just want to earn money and, and, and have an easy job, um, there's usually something that, that is in the literature is called shirking, that is the agents find ways to fulfill their tasks with as little um, work as possible. And so you can probably imagine how that's going to look like, right? So they might receive these sort of centralized instructions what to do, and they might just have like one specific message that they copy and paste in different accounts. Um, they might engage in retweeting more, um, in sharing um, um, other, other people's contents than their own. Um, and they might retweet that um, in different, using different accounts in in, in a relatively short time, they might retweet each other a lot, and they might only work when they're actively supervised. So if they're sort of hired by the hour, they might only work during the during office hours, for instance. Um, okay, so the patterns that we found in, in this campaign in, in, in 2012 in, 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 South, in South Korea um, were, were sort of corresponded to these expectations. So we have these NIS accounts, the Secret Service accounts tend to post during office hours, while the regular Korean uh, speaking accounts tended to post in, in, in the late uh, after work, right? Um, the Secret Service tended to post not as much during the weekend, um, while the regular users sort of went on and did the usual amount of posting. Um, and we can sort of see when the Secret Service's um, um, campaign uh, takes off. Um, and then it ends a, a couple of days before the actual election, which is this spike here in, in the other, um, because that basically that was the moment they were discovered. Um, so that's that. In terms of coordin well, in terms of coordination, oops, sorry. Okay, no. There we go. So what we discovered among the secret service accounts is there's a lot of retweeting. That's just sort of a picture I want to take, uh, that, you, that a message I want to take, I want you to take away from this parable here. Um, if we look at the actual sort of code tweeting behavior, so each circle is an account, each uh, line is an instance of whether they posted the same information in, within a one um, minute time window. Um, then you can see these sort of clusters emerging, but these sort of all, almost in the, all in some case, independent components in the network. Um, and in this case, particularly, we also have the information on which agent controlled which account or was the main responsible of the account. And that this is indicated by the numbers. So you really see sort of each agent was controlling multiple accounts and tended to tweet similar things, right? So that's why you have these nice little um, nice little clusters there. Same thing for pro retweeting. Again, there's also some connection across the agents. So we still have sort of larger components, um, but there's also these sort of very distinct components for each agent, basically. Um, and then we use this to sort of detect additional accounts by looking at 
Um, do you retweet more than 50% already known um, uh, astroturfing accounts, or do you co-tweet or co-retweet with them? And we found additional accounts that also looked rather suspicious of, on, on manual inspections, and we know that there were more accounts involved in this campaign because there was some intense negotiation going on between the, the prosecution and the defense um, to kick out certain information. So that seems to sort of correspond to what we think is we should be finding. And so the question then is, well, this was almost 10 years ago now. Surely astroturfing has evolved and people are getting more sophisticated. So this shouldn't really work in, in more recent campaigns, right? And so we went to the Twitter archive on elections integrity, um, where Twitter has sort of disclosed um, um, campaign disinformation or specific sort of inauthentic uh, coordination um, in the context of elections. Um, and sort of gathered everything they have published until up to, uh, until 2020, mid end 2020. So these are all the different sort of data sets they have published. Um, not all, some data sets contain different campaigns in the sense that they target different countries. Um, there are also some campaigns that are um, comprised in different data sets. And it's not entirely clear why they're um, published in separate data sets, but that's the data that we have. Um, if you sort of look at what the tweets look like and what sort of strategies these campaign might employ. We have very different strategies. We have campaigns that do almost exclusively retweeting, um, some that do very little retweeting. We have campaigns that look uh, that have a majority tweets that contain hashtags, others that have very little hashtags, some that do heavy sharing of URLs, others that do less. So there's so all sorts of different um, strategies all sorts of different countries, all sorts of different languages, right? So it's a very diverse set. Um, and so in order to sort of figure out whether these patterns that we see are unusual, we would have to have a baseline. And so the question becomes in, in social science, especially what is a reasonable baseline? Usually the idea is, well, we take a random sample of users and we could do that, right? We could randomly sample Twitter ID um, numbers. Um, but that would sort of lead to trivial conclusions in a sense, because these people would be all over the world, right? They speak different languages. It's very un unlikely that you would find people um, um, engaging in similar behavior in that, that, that way. So one approach that we use is to say, well, astroturfing campaigns usually try to imitate citizens of a specific country. So how about we use a sort of a location-based random sample? Um, we were relying on Brandwatch at that point because we didn't have an academic Twitter account, and that was that um, happened later, right? Um, but that might still be a problem because then you're sort of comparing people who are interested in football, baseball, K-pop uh, with people who are interested in politics. Um, and so we had an additional random sample where we also looked at whether the account, whether we sampled accounts that used the same most prominent hashtags that the AstroTurfing campaign itself on. And so we're just basically saying the AstroTurfers are trying to infiltrate the specific issue public that talks about specific topics as indicated by the hashtags. And so we want to, the, the sort of baseline is this other people who engage in this particular com, um, public discourse. Um, and so we use the hashtags to, to identify those. And in both cases, um, do we then, we, we, over, we oversample, we get more accounts than um, the ones in the astroturfing campaign, um, and then stratify for activity level. Because again, you could imagine that you get accounts that are a lot less active or a lot more active than the astroturfing accounts. And then the patterns that you might find in terms of coordination or non-coordination non might simply be due to the fact that the accounts are not very active, for instance. Um, so we're trying to mimic, as, we're trying to make us come up with a, a challenging as possible, a baseline or a comparison group um, to the to the astroturfers as we, as we could think of. And so if we look at posting of the day in these accounts, and we're, we're just looking at a couple of these um, campaigns that Twitter published just because it would get too much too messy in terms of the lines we have. Um, so for the AstroTurfer, and here we're using the location-based um, sample, but, we, but the hashtag-based sample is, 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 has, has very similar patterns. And so you again see the sort of AstroTurfers tend to be more active during the, during the work hours, and then in the evening, the activity declines. Um, while the um, random users tend to become more active overall in, 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 in the evening. And they also tend to sort of maintain their level of activity on the weekend while the astroturfers um, don't seem to be working as heavily on the weekend. Um, if you look at 
um, sort of the, the, the networks of coordination. Um, here's one example from the IRA campaign against the US election. Um, and so we sort of compare here the random sample where you see there is some, um, some co-tweeting or co-retweeting, um, but compared to the, um, to the um, co co-tweeting and co-retweeting that's happening among the astroturfers, it's, it's minuscule. Um, and we are reasonably, so you get more than 80% of the um, astroturfers that Twitter identified, we can sort of find in this coordination network. And there's a relatively small percentage that is not um, does not co-tweet or co-retweet within a one minute um, time window. Um, while on the other hand, for the random sample, we have really a very small percentage of, of, of accounts that engage in this sort of coordinated behavior. Um, of course, if you increase the time window and say, well, we uh, assume that coordination can also happen within the same hour or even within the same day, then you're um, identifying more astroturfers, but of course you also then run the risk of identifying more regular users as being part of a campaign, which they probably are not, right? You're assuming that the regular users that we randomly sampled are not part of a campaign, which of course they could be. Um, the IRA campaign is interesting because we know that they targeted very different publics. So there was one part that was targeting sort of Black Lives Matter, more sort of left, a left audience, and another part of the campaign that targeted right wings by Republicans. And so we were sort of surprised to find that they nevertheless form one component. So here we have different um, types of um, astroturfers, that is from Lyndall and Warren. They sort of manually coded that. Um, and so if you look at the left trolls and the right trolls, they're still connected. Um, through sort of coordinated uh, messaging. And the interesting, I mean, what, what sort of connects them here is the fact is the hashtag um, Oscar so white, where basically the left wing trolls, the Black Lives Matter trolls, found common grounds with the right trolls that were specific sort of in trying to mimic Black African, African Americans that are gun rights advocates. So they found common ground there. And so this is still forming sort of a connected component, even though they in theory are targeting very, very different audiences. And you would maybe expect the message to be very different to these audiences. Um, we can vary the threshold, right? As I already said, and we've chosen sort of one minute because as you can see, we have again sort of location-based sample on the top, hashtag-based sample on the bottom. The difference is not that big. And so basically the red one sort of indicates how many astroturfing accounts can we, um, can we identify. Ideally, we want that to be 100%. And how many um, random sample users do we um, accidentally identify as being part of the campaign? And ideally, we want that to be 0%. Um, and so um, one minute doesn't seem to be too bad a sort of a, a, a general cutoff um, because that's usually the place where um, in the in the random sample you still you don't have a lot of coordination at that level um, but you could sort of increase it as well up to an hour or maybe more or even sort of a work day and it would still work reasonably well um, and so if just in sort of like how well does this sort of very very simple approach right how well does it do in terms of identifying the, uh, the, the known astroturfers um, quite well across most of the of the, of the data sets, right? On average, it's seventy five percent. There are some campaigns, but not necessarily the most recent ones, right? Um, where where it doesn't quite do as well as as as, as in as in some of the um, some of the other campaigns, um, which we sort of found was rather surprising, right? We would sort of hope that hey, don't these people learn and find more sophisticated ways of coordinating, um, and 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 we didn't really find much of that, right? You could imagine you could increase the time period between the messages sent to make it a bit less obvious, right? You could maybe vary the messages a bit, just add a word here, subtract one here, right? And we've done a bit more of the sophisticated stuff as well with machine learning, natural language processing, but it really didn't seem to add much to that. So we sort of, in the end, we boiled it down again to the very basic thing. Um, but partly our theory might explain why, right? So preventing this sort of shirking behavior and, and, and copy pasting and doing very simple stuff is costly as well for the principal. And so the principal might decide, well, yeah, my agents are not really putting up a very convincing astroturfing campaign, a grassroots campaign. Um, but, you know, as long as we manage to fly past the radar and get our message across, if then like two months later, the, the researchers figure out that we've done something wrong, you know, we've already done our, we've done our work, so we don't care. Um, but that might also mean that this, uh, that astroturfing campaigns might actually remain detectable through these relatively simple, um, simple methods. 
Um, and as I said, right, one of the advantage of this, uh, this, this method is that it's really relatively simple and it could be applicable also to other platforms as long as they have some sort of basic stable account so that you're not, not everyone is anonymous and um, have a function of sharing and posting things, which is almost all platforms, right? And it should work also across languages without having to deal with like different grammatical structures and issues like that. Um, possible issues here, right? You might be worried that Twitter basically only captures the not so sophisticated campaigns and not so sophisticated campaigns rely very heavily on this sort of like copy pasting. Um, that might be true. We don't really know how Twitter um, like hacks these campaigns. Um, we have, however, found that there is co-tweeting and co-retweeting across the different data sets that they publish in the case of Iran, for instance. So, which we find strange because we would assume if Twitter really relies on our method to find these um, campaigns, they would figure out that these two that these two sets of accounts are actually part of the same campaign and publish them at the same time. Um, but yeah, that is that is that is a possibility, right? Um, one could also imagine that we could program more sophisticated social bots, and so and social bots obviously don't have the problem that they shirk. So if that happens, then, then we might be in a bit of a problem with, with this approach. Um, on the other hand, right, we could try to complement this approach with more sophisticated approaches um, and, and, and detection methods. Um, what I'm not so sure and what I would be interested to explore is to what degree this sort of coordinated behavior that we've also seen in the other presentations would also highlight campaigns that are genuine grassroots movements. Um, especially if these grassroots movements coordinate on a third party, uh, on a third platform, right? Um, then we might observe this sort of rather suspicious patterns also for something that we would um, describe as a grassroots movement. Um, and that's not as easy, right? Unless we can find some very bona fide grassroots movement and compare them, we are not really sure whether we might accidentally um, designate certain genuine grassroots movement can, campaigns as astroturfing as campaigns, because obviously there is coordinated uh, messaging going on in, in grassroots movements as well. So that's it. That's all I have. And um, thank you for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you, Francisco, and thank you all for some really interesting uh, presentations.